Good morning, Allah. Everybody hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Um, do we have uh, Mesa in court? Yes. Yes. Good morning, Mesa. Good morning. Um, uh, it's nine o'clock London time, and so if the parties are ready, we can get yes, underway and you can recite the form of words that you have to uh, right away. Okay. Uh, I would like to begin by reading out a statement, which in return I will ask you and counsel to confirm is correct. I hope that is okay. The hearing, on, uh, the hearing on this application hearing is being held in the DIFC courts in Dubai. Although Justice Sir Richard Field, the judge hearing this application, is appearing by way of a video conference from London, any orders or directions made after or during the course of this application will be issued by the, by the registry in Dubai on Justice Sir Richard Field's instructions. Will the judge and parties representatives please confirm that the situation is I have stated? I so confirm. We do, we do confirm, Your Honor. I confirm, too, sir. Thank you very much. We are here for an application hearing in the matter of CFI 029-2018 before Justice Sir, Sir Richard Field. The claimant is represented by Canaan Advocates and Legal Consultant. The lead counsel is Samir Canaan. The defendant is represented by Hamdan al-Shamsi Lawyers and Legal Consultants. Lead counsel is Roger Bowden. Well, now, gentlemen, I wonder if I could begin with a few introductory remarks and observations. Uh, I have um, had the opportunity of looking at uh, the documents in this case in some detail, and I'm going to uh, adopt a way of proceeding which is designed to get through the material as efficiently as possible. There will be occasions when I shall take the uh, applicant submissions as read, and I shall want to hear from um, the claimant defendant to the counterclaim in response, and possibly, uh, in certain instances, the reverse will be true. Now, Mr. Bowden, in the documents that um, uh, I have been provided, I am missing some of the pages of the um, exhibit to Mr. El Fadel's second witness statement. Can I give you, please, an example? I'm just... Um, Just give me a moment. I'm sorry to hold you up. Quite a lot of documentation uh, came through um, um, overnight. So just bear with me, if you would, please. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bowden, uh, it's in relation, I think, to your claims um, six and seven. Can we look at your um, skeleton argument where you deal with um, the claims for six and seven?
No, it's, it's number seven, Mr. Bowden. Claim number seven. If we just turn that up, it's page 11 of your most recent skeleton argument. And in paragraph um, 40, you set out the definition of a um, daily wage. Yes, sir. And you make a reference to um, one of the exhibits, the Mr. El Fadil's um, um, second witness statement, which I have been unable to put my hand on. I have the exhibits are given numbers A, E, and then 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and the like. And there's an exhibit that is referred to about the calculation. It's either of salary or of holiday pay, um, which I do not have. I think the exhibit that's referred to is AE 2.8. Now, my exhibit 2.8, AE 2.8, consists of some emails. At the top of the page, there's an email from um, Mr. L. <coughs> Fadil, dated the 22nd of October, sent to you, Mr. Bowden, and there's a heading, Attachments. And there's a, an email... Uh, in, on, in the second half of the page, which looks as if there is correspondence going on um, uh, uh, either between Mr. El Fadl and his lawyers or between the lawyers and the lawyers. Is, does that match your 2.8, Mr. Bowden? Yes, it, it does, sir, and I'm uh, feeling a little embarrassed. Um, I, I confess, sir, that I believe that the reference of a, B, two, um, two, two point eight, which must be the one I'm referring to. Uh, I think it must be wrong, sir, because then it, next to it it says exhibit W B one point one at internal page three, and, and that, sir, will be indeed found in bundle number three under exhibit W B, sir. Bundle three, yes, yeah. sorry, um, okay. Sorry, my, my apologies, sir. Bundle AB2. Yeah. Go on. And, and it's exhibit WB, sir. Let me just give you that. This is an exhibit to Mr. Beckley's uh, um, statement, Indeed, is it? Sir. Yes, it is, sir. Right, can you take me to that? page WB 1.1, sir, the internal page 3. What are we looking at, an email or what? An email, sir, from Elisa Tunsi. Okay, well, my, the bundle you're calling AB2 yes, sir. Um, we had at the pre-trial review, and it yes, consists yes, of the first witness statement of Mr. Beckley, the exhibit to Mr. Beckley's statement, the third witness statement of Mr. Jabara, and the exhibit to Mr. Jabara's witness statement. Are we looking at the same bundle? Yes, we are, sir. And I'm right. looking for it under WWB, which goes from WB1, which goes from page five onwards. 
Yeah, page five bonds. Can you tell me which, um, what the page number is that I should be looking at for that reference to the calculation? Can sue, but uh, I'm well, look, um, so I apologize. Not to, to, don't, don't worry about it at the moment. Perhaps your assistant, but we can get underway. There's much else to be getting on with, and per perhaps your um, assistant could uh, track down where in the bundles. Uh, appear yes. the email that you rely on for the calculation of the entitlement. Yes. And we'll come to that later on in the hearing. Thank you, sir. Is that right. all right? I'm very grateful. Okay. Okay. Now, um, what I want to do is, first of all, going through Mr. O'Faddle's applications is to just um, summarise the applications as we come to them. Uh, and I'm going then, I'm going to ask Mr. Cannon to uh, develop his response to the application. In other words, um, I'm proceeding on the basis of the written submissions of the applicant on behalf of Mr. El Fadil. And I'm going to want Mr. Cannon to respond. And I want to start with the first application, which is to set aside the judgment in default for the, um, the pleaded sum of AED 1,376,000, which I think was a mistaken sum. The, 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 the correct sum was 1,344,000. 277 um, dirhams. Now, Mr. Cannon, yes. uh, as, yes, uh, it seems clear to me that the Industrial Group Limited accept that the judgment that was obtained should be set aside. The sums in question are sums which are no longer alleged to be due. And the dispute is as to what order, if any, as to costs ought to be made upon an order that the first judgment obtained should be set aside. Yes, sir. Now, uh, the in fact, sorry. Sorry to, to interrupt you. No, that's all right. Okay. Let, I'll just finish and then I'll hear you. Yeah. Um, Mr. El Fadil is asking for the costs of seeking and obtaining the setting aside of the judgment on the indemnity basis. And um, in your written submissions, you say that that is not a proper basis for the costs. Now, my first question to you is this. Do you accept that upon the setting aside of the judgment that some order as to costs ought to be made against your client? Sir, it's a given that the the the, uh, the claim uh, to set up was accepted uh, to, to to set aside. However, uh, 
The issue here is not only related to the question of that this amount found to be to, to be paid back by Abdul Azim. The issue, I believe, it's somewhere more than that. This relates to Article 160 of the Law of Obligations. Uh, this is a, a, this is to start with. It's a breach of the oblig uh, of his uh, of Abdul Azim obligations of loyalty. Uh, this was found later on. Therefore, this continued to be a subject of uh, of exchange of views and discussions. So this, we I believe, that this should be reserved for the trial and not at this point of time, because at the trial we can examine, you, your, your Honor can examine all the arguments in this regard and why we believe that even if the default judgment is set aside, the fact remains that this, the setting aside of the, of the judgment will not affect the reasons uh, that Abdul Azim had committed a breach, a clear breach uh, under Article 160. This has to be evaluated and has to be duly explained during the trial and not at this point of time. Well, setting aside the judgment does not preclude your client from maintaining its case that the dismissal for cause was a good dismissal. I mean, what your client did was to obtain a money judgment for 1,376,000 dirhams and on the basis of a claim where you alleged dishonesty. The dishonesty element of the claim, after the judgment had been obtained, was, was amended and was taken out of the pleading. You can't continue to be the beneficiary of a judgment for 1,376,000 um, dirhams when it is accepted by your client that those sums are not due, that there has been sufficient uh, authorization for you to have no legal claim for that money. And it seems to me to be plain that this um, judgment must be set aside. I've, I've said that that does not mean you cannot at trial argue that the dismissal for cause was a good dismissal for cause uh, for a number of reasons including the alleged want of authority for these payments. So I want to make it clear uh -huh. to you I'm going to make an order, but wait a moment, I'm going to make an order setting aside this judgment. But the question we've got to move on to is what order as to costs um, ought to be made. Your clients obtained a money judgment they should never have obtained. Uh, Your Honor, of and course... And they did so on the back of a claim of dishonesty, which is no yeah. longer persisted in. Uh, the dishonesty, uh, Your Honor, it, is, it will be at the, at the trial event will be explained fully why we believe that this is a dishonesty yeah, this, this, uh, this matter was based on dishonesty and not fulfilling the, the obligations of Abdul Azim of the, uh, well, of would the you please Would you please take up the case management bundle? And would you look at tab three? One second. Yes. 
These well, are which, your clients and bended of... particulars of claim. Well, can I and ask if you go to page, honor? if you go to page 22 of 22. the of the CMC bundle. Yeah. You'll see a date. Yes. The sir. original date was the 24th of June, and that's now struck through because it's been amended as of the 12th of February. Right. Now, this was the pleading on which the judgment was obtained. Now, Have a look at paragraph 19. The original pleading was that Mr. El Fadil sought to make the transfer from the claimant's account to his account without the claimant's knowledge and with the intention that the transaction not be disclosed to the claimant. That's what you, your client, was alleging when the judgment in default was granted. And that is now abandoned. There's a line through it. Then turn the page. Look at paragraph 21, the last sentence. The payment of these amounts was deliberately and dishonestly concealed from the claimant by the defendant. That was your client's allegation when the judgment was obtained. And that's now abandoned. All your allegations of negligence are struck out by amendment. Uh, Your Honor, actually these were struck out and, uh, and accepted to, to stay the, uh, the, the judgment, the default judgment, by the earlier lawyers. But when we, when we looked again at the contents and the, uh, our, our position, it was found, yes, the amount was paid. We ha uh, it was paid from the personal account of, the, of Abdel Azim back to the, uh, yeah, this was really paid and, co and completed. The payment was completed. But the fact remains, in our opinion, that this honesty was uh, the, the basis of this uh, claim was the dishonesty itself. And this honesty had been purely established as you, uh, based, as you have commented, Your Honor. So because of this, we have various arguments uh, to, to deal with on, on this issue itself. Uh, this is why we are of the opinion that this should be dealt at the trial. For example, on March 20, 2017, the applicant created an internal 
This is actually tab 18, page 224.4. The, 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 uh, the applicant uh, created an internal memorandum under the, the heading treatment of, chairman, of chairman's current account. This is, had been created by Abdul Azim himself and not by the, by the company. So uh, this is what we, in, in addition to other arguments that may, may prevail, Your Honor, this is why we are still of the opinion that the, the cost should be, uh, sh should be made during the, the trial. The decision on the cost should be made during the trial and not at this point of time. Well, now, look, you listen to me very carefully because we yes. are on a very important subject of what is professionally acceptable and what is not. This pleading was amended to remove the allegations of dishonesty and deliberate concealment. These pleadings have been the subject of scrutiny by junior judicial officers and in particular on the CMC. Even if you were to apply to resurrect allegations of dishonesty, you would very likely be refused permission. Lawyers can't play fast and loose with such serious allegations made against an individual. And I'm very disappointed to hear you submit that notwithstanding this pleading and the amendments made in it, that on behalf of your clients, you're going to seek to rehabilitate these allegations of dishonesty. The view I take is that this claim for this total sum of money was made without proper investigation as to whether or not there was um, a, a basis for recovery. Your client has since accepted that there is no such basis for recovery. Judgment was made and given on the basis of allegations of uh, dishonesty and deliberate concealment. And I am of the view that not only must that judgment be set aside, but that your client must pay the costs of having it set aside on an indemnity basis. It was quite improper and wrong for this judgment to have been obtained in the way it was. Now, I want to make it clear that, as I have said to you, it remains open to your client, without reference to dishonesty, but reference to uh, non-compliance with procedures, protocols, and the like, to say that this is an example amongst others that justifies the dismissal. That is still open to you at trial. Accepted, Your Honour. But so, so, but so far as this uh, judgment is concerned, um, it's been accepted by your predecessors, uh, Gibson Dunn, that this judgment must be set aside. The only dispute was as to costs. And I'm now making my ruling for the uh, uh, reasons that I have given that the judgment must be set aside and it must be with costs on an indemnity basis. I was wish to add this, that the court, in my judgment, has jurisdiction to set aside this judgment. These are extraordinary circumstances. It is accepted that the judgment should be set aside. The dispute has been as to costs. There is a provision in the rules, in Rule 36.33, which is not included in those rules concerned with setting aside judgments and default, that provides that a person who is not a party 
but who is directly affected by a judgment or order may apply to have the judgment or order set aside or varied. And in my opinion, it is to be implied that if a non-party may apply to have a judgment set aside that should never have been entered, then the party him or itself may make such an application. And so I find the court has jurisdiction to set this judgment aside, and that is my ruling on the first claim. I do not need to deal with the, uh, the submissions based on no proper service. That is unnecessary for me to deal with, since there were ample grounds to set the judgment aside that I have outlined. Now, may we then go to the second claim. The second claim is that they want struck. I say they, forgive me, Mr. El Fadil, wants struck out of the claim, the claim in respect of AED 1,443,817.62 dirhams. Your Honour, on, uh, on the basis of your findings, we do accept also to, to, uh, to withdraw our, uh, to, uh, to, to accept the, uh, the set aside and to, to accept also the, the cost. Relevant Thank cost. you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm moving on to the second claim, the second strikeout claim. I, I'm working through Mr. El Fadil's second witness statement and the skeleton argument. This, this claim is pleaded in paragraphs, um, the original paragraph uh, 30 of the amended points of claim served by um, the, the claimant defendant to the counterclaim. And <laughs> it is now um, accepted that this sum of money has been dealt with in an authorised fashion. And we see this by looking at the amended reply and defence to counterclaim. That's in the, um, the CMC bundle at page 91. So if you would go to page 91 in the CMC bundle... Now, yes, this sir. is Annex 2. Yes. And this is in respect of that figure that I've mentioned, the 1,443,817 odd. And we see there that Part A is reimbursement claims which are admitted. Now, at one point, it was admitted that the claim in respect of 10,000 Swiss francs was admitted. And then without the permission of the court, that admission has been abandoned and it's re-established in Part B. But the 10,000 francs point does not arise in respect of this strikeout claim. It arises uh, in respect of uh, another part of the claim. Now, given the admission that these re uh, reimbursement claims are admitted, what are, is your submission contrary to the uh, contention that uh, this claim should be struck out of your pleading?
That's your answer, Ram. Yes, Your Honor. You want me to, to respond to this? Yes, please. And, and just uh, could I just draw your attention to one other thing before you make your response? Yes. If you go to page 172 in the CMC bundle, this is the case memorandum, yes. your client's case memorandum for the CMC. And if you look at paragraph 14 at page 172, yes, yes, it right. says that a TIG, that's your client, identified the amounts of 1.34 million and 1.44 million and 490,000 as unauthorized. Subsequently, in its amended reply and amended defense, your client admitted that many of the sums transferred to Mr. El Fadl's bank account were by way of reimbursement of expenses incurred by him on behalf of TIG. The payments comprising 1.443 million were made with the approval of TIG and recorded in the accounts. And Mr. El Fadl was entitled to be reimbursed the amount of AED 1.344 million. However, TIG maintains that the procedures adopted by Mr. El Fadl in making these various payments did not comply with the policies of TIG and justified his termination for cause. Uh, Your Honor, we still believe that although this, this claim had been satisfied, but the fact remains that this payment has been made without any authorization from the side of TIG. This is which this is one. Of, I mean, this is the reason why we are we believe that uh, this had, has to be reserved for the trial. But it is. I mean, but what what he is mentioning here, Abdul Azim, that this had been had been authorized, this is totally un, uh, uh, untrue because this, all these TIG were never, were never aware of these, tra of, of, the, of the transactions made out of the personal account of Abdul Azim. They came only to their knowledge in a later stage uh, 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 when, when the, the, the Deloitte wa were making their internal audit. This is, this is a, a, a finding which happened in 2017 and 2018. Yes, I follow. Well, can you help me with um, subparagraph B in paragraph 14? Subparagraph B reads, the payments comprising AED 1.443 odd million were made with the approval of TIG this is, and recorded uh, in the accounts of TIG. Uh, Your Honor, uh, yes, it was recorded by Abdul Azim himself and not, of course, he was the CFO of the, of the company and normally a CFO is in charge of the accounts. So if he has registered this on the, uh, on the register, on the, on the accounts, of course, this is what happened. But then, when Deloitte started making their inspection, they found, they found this entry, which was not brought to the attention of the, uh, uh, of the TIG chairman any time earlier to the findings of the Deloitte. So what is saying here is, does not comply with the, with the facts, uh, Your Honor. Well... Clearly, in subparagraph B, a distinction is being drawn between TIG on the one hand and Mr. El Fadl on the other. And this um, memorandum was written on behalf of your client, 
by your clients, then very reputable, reputable lawyers, Gibson Dunn, and it says what it says, that the payments were made with the approval of TIG. You can't What's construe that as meaning with the approval of Mr. El Fadl. Uh, How do you explain Honor, that? It is simple, because uh, with all due respect to Gibson and Dunn, but the fact remains that possibly at that time the facts were not clear to them. But the, the fact remains that he, he was the CFO and he was in charge of recording the accounts and entering these accounts. So if, he, if Abdul Azim has done this himself, uh, this has definitely has, has been, uh, uh, it is his uh, decision at that time. But it's another fact that uh, TIG chairman wa was never aware of this transaction earlier to the findings of Deloitte and thereafter E and Y, Ernest and Young. Yes, I follow. Um, well, can we look at the pleading, please? Um, go to page 17 of the CMC bundle. It's in tab 3. Yes, Your Honor. Right. Now, there's a heading, unauthorized payments from the claimant's funds to the defendant. <laughs> and it's pleaded that to date there's been identified a significant number of other unapproved transactions from the claimant's bank accounts to Mr. El Fadl's personal bank accounts dating back to 2013. Then in the new paragraph 30, there's a plea of breach which includes an allegation of dishonesty. The claimant has identified a number of payments transferred that were approved by the defendant without following the proper procedure and with no or with only unsatisfactory supporting documents to justify those payments. And then you get the plea for the 1.443. And it said that there's a table of unauthorized non-salary payments during this period approved by and paid to Mr. L. Fadl, which is his Annex 2. And then you go to Annex 2. And now it says that the reimbursement claims are admitted and the support documents are identified. Uh, in fact, Your Honor, if I may comment on this, that this was the first the, the personal payments out of his account happened between 2013 and 2015. And this definitely was made without the knowledge or approval of the chairman at that time. And even the second payment, which happened in, 2000, in 2016, 2017, was not aware of it. It, this, it came only to the, uh, to the attention of the chairman uh, during the Deloitte, Deloitte uh, audit and thereafter the E&Y e audit, which has this, this ha which the findings regarding these two trans these, uh, the payments in 2013 and even in 2016, 2017, was only found uh, with the audit made in 2018. So this is why, this is what we said, definitely it was not agreed or approved. Otherwise, 
if this w w was brought to the attention of the chairman in, during the period of between two, as from 2013 of this irregularity, uh, he would have then at that time decided to terminate the, the services of Abdul Azim. But unfortunately, this was brought to his attention much later in 2018. Because again, I repeat your honor, he was the one, he was the, the, the officer to be in charge of these, of all these accounts. So he decided what to release, he decided what, what, what to, to put on record or not to put on record. So this is, this is why it is, uh, uh, again, I say it's, it's essential that this argument, if your honor agrees to, to be re reserved for the trial, but of course we agree with your uh, rulings, whatever it is, your honor. Well, um, if the, let's call it breach of procedures for the moment, if the breach of procedures alleged in respect of these payments is to be part of your case justifying dismissal, the pleading must make that very clear that your claim is in respect of a failure to follow proper procedures, notwithstanding that the reimbursement claim is admitted and the support documents are identified in Annex 2. Now, Mr. Bowden, can I talk, make a simple comment? Uh, just, I just want to have a word with Mr. Bowden. Sure. Can you hear me, Mr. Bowden? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yes, I can hear you very well, sir. Can you now oh, good. hear me? Good. Now, there's, there's no claim for reimbursement in respect of... Um, these sums, the, the two sums, the 1.443 odd million and the 1.344 odd million. That's right, sir. Um, it is said that the alleged breach of procedures all go to an overall case of justification for the dismissal. Correct, sir. Now, why shouldn't that go to trial, that particular issue? It should, sir. I agree. It should. You agree. Okay. Well, so what I'm going to um, direct in respect of the second application is that the, um, the claims for um, breach of procedures and breach of policies in respect of the 1.443 odd million and the 1.344 odd million may proceed strictly in respect of the claimant's case that the dismissal was justified. And so I, that's my, my ruling on um, number two. So we move on to um, the 490,000. That's the, the, um, the third application. Now, this, is, this claim for 490,000 was pleaded in paragraph 36. It's on page um, 18 of the CMC bundle. 
And that paragraph reads, the claimant has identified additional non-salary payments procured by the defendant from the claimant's bank accounts to his own personal bank account, totaling 490000 without the knowledge of the claimant and without the requisite prior written approvals from his superior. Investigations into the unauthorized payments during this period are ongoing. Now, it isn't clear from this plea whether it is a claim for reimbursement of the 490,000 uh, in addition to further justification for the dismissal. Now, Mr. Cannon, is your client seeking to recover AED 490,000 in respect of this claim? No, no, Your Honour, not at all. Not at all? We are, we are and I for, think, do, do I remember correctly that when we had the pre-trial review, it was accepted that the 490,000 was, was not a claim for that sum of money? We agree. I think that's right. I, I can't remember. That's right. Sure. And your case in respect of this is the same as in respect of the, uh, the, the second application, that this ought to go to trial as part of your justification for dismissal. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honour. Yes. And Mr. Bowden, um, I think you're constrained to accept that that issue can go to trial. Yes, Your Honour. Well, yes, Sue. We, yes. we don't know anything about the 490,000, but, but um, uh, on the assumption that some evidence will come forward to demonstrate that it Well, you, it can, you can seek further, yeah, you can seek further and better particulars. It'll be for the, the claimant to make out its case. They're going to have to give discovery. Uh, you may uh, be entitled to further and better particulars and so on. But it must all be in respect of justification for dismissal. Indeed, sir. From oh, our side, uh, good. We, we are ready to, to, to strike off and we don't want to proceed in it. So, um, Mr. Cannon, as I understand it, your client wishes to rely on paragraph 36 and 37 in the amended uh, points of claim uh, on page 18 of the CMC as further justification for dismissal of Mr. Elf Adil. Can you confirm that? Sorry, Your Honor, I didn't. Uh, I missed out what, what you're saying. Your Shall Honor? I say it again? Um, yeah. I want your confirmation or non-confirmation that it will be your client's case in respect of a sum of money of 490,000 AED that the way in which Mr. El Fadil dealt with that alleged payment is part of your case that dismissal for cause was justified? No, it's not, Your Honour. It's not? We want to, to, to strike it out. You want it, you want it to go? OK. Very well. Uh, thank you very much for making that clear, um, Mr. Cannon. That, 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 uh, that, that claim is struck out. Now, now we come to the, the, the Merab. Do I pronounce that correctly? Merab claim? This was the grant of credit, where Merab were uh, um, granted credit in, res in, in respect of um, a cost of uh, goods of 1,718,750 Saudi rials, correct? Correct. Now, would you be kind enough to go to uh, page 119 
Oh, no, not that one. Sorry, I've got the wrong reference. Just give me a minute. Uh, in the hearing bundle, volume one of the hearing bundle, at page 120, if you could just, if you like, put your finger in there for a moment. And um, can we look at how it's pleaded in the CMC um, bundle at page 164? I'm sorry that we have to have both bundles under review at one and the same time. So if you'd be kind enough to go to page 164 in the CMC bundle... Oh, I'm so sorry. That's a bad reference. I, I think it, it might be page 15 of the CMC bundle. It's 15. Here. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. That, that was the order on the CMC. Page 15, please, gentlemen, uh, in the CMC bundle. Right, now looking at that, there's a heading, Ernst & Young Investigation. And um, in 22A, B, C and D, there is a pleading as to what emerged from that investigation. If you look at D, it says a significant volume and value of payments were made by the defendant to unrecognized vendors who had been created in the system by the defendant bypassing the claimant's proper procurement process for payments to vendors. Now, the, the Merab claim comes in as particulars in little two. One example of the failure occurred in September 2015 when goods to the value of the sum we've mentioned were supplied to Merab by one of the subsidiaries on a credit basis, on the authority and with the approval of the defendant, when Merab was already indebted in the sum of Saudi rials, 7.7 odd million. And the whole amount is irrecoverable. Now there's an argument as to whether that claim has been properly pleaded as a particular of the Ernst & Young investigation. I want to put that on one side for the moment. What I want you to note is the date that's alleged in the particulars, that the credit was extended with the approval of Mr. El Fadil in September 2015. And then in the application bundle, page 120, well, perhaps we should look at page 119 to begin with. These are emails in connection with the grant of the credit. And if you look at the email that's at the bottom of that page, it says, we discussed this subject with Mr. Hatem and Mr. Abdul Laz Lazarim, which is Mr. El Fadel, today, and they have agreed to continue with Merab business based on 60 days PT with the following conditions. PDC, I take that to be post-dated check. Is that agreed? 
PDC yes. normally stands yes, for post-dated post -dated right. check. Post-dated check to be provided to cover the new orders with 60 days credit. PDC with Saudi Reels 2.5 million to be provided to secure the old outstanding Saudi Reels 7 million. Saudi Reels 300,000 to be submitted for cash collection on monthly basis from the old OS and for the monthly order of Merab should not exceed more than 2.2 million Saudi Reals until 2015. So those were the terms of the credit that were agreed and implemented in 2015. Now, w when you look at page 120, this is the account of the credit account that has been granted in favour of Mera. And what one notices straight away is that the, the account continued to be operated after 2015. And on that basis, how can it be said that the, the credit of 1.7 million that was extended has never, is a loss to the company when the account continued to be run and maintained after the extension of that credit. Uh, uh, Your Honour, you, you referred just now to the email regarding yes, I did. the proposed, yes, the, the, the proposed conditions for the continuing of transactions, financial transactions, and, and supply to, uh, to uh, Marab. Yes. What happens here is that neither of these conditions, first, this was not a matter to be approved, uh, which has been approved by the chairman, no. This is an exchange of, uh, uh, of, of opinions or, or conditions to be placed if uh, subject to, to Mar'ad approval. To, but there is nothing that would evidence that Mar'ad uh, uh, approved these conditions in order to continue to, to, to give them uh, credit facilities and all this. In, in spite of, uh, of none of Mar'ad, uh, none, uh, none uh, compliance at least with these conditions, Abdul Azim decided to grant them further, uh, further credit without any authorization from the side of the chairman. Yes, but your pleading focuses on the grant of credit terms in 2015. That's what you pleaded. Yes. And my point to you is that how can you say that the grant of that credit is implicit in the final and outstanding balance on the account? The, uh, the, the, the base, the, the principal earlier am amount was never re reduced. It remains as it is. Uh, in spite of, of all this, Abdul Azim decided personally to, 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 to grant them further facilities, which caused a, a, a high, a high uh, risk and uh, high losses to the, to the German. But you don't plead that with respect. You plead that credit to the extent of 1.7 million was granted when it shouldn't have been granted in 2015. Yes, Your Honour, this is... Uh, and an we, we've got a running price. account... Sorry? Uh, we have no, a running account is, here. 
Yeah. Running account with the discretion of Abdul Azim. Yes, I'm so sorry, but you, you've got to... You've pleaded <coughs> a breach in 2015. And that's how you get the figure. Your claim is in respect of the credit that was extended in 2015. And what I don't understand at the moment is how you can say that that credit was not in fact paid off and other extensions have been made which you don't plead and we don't know anything about. Uh, this is a, a credit limit, uh, Your Honour. I'm sorry, the I didn't hear million. that. Forgive me. The, the, the seven million was the credit limit which already was exceeded. It's the credit, earlier credit limit, which had been authorized to, to Mar'ab. But it, it does not re represent any such payments. And, and that does not re represent the actual t t transactions. It's only a question of credit limit. And in spite of the, uh, the Mar'ab failure to honor their obligations under this credit limit, the, uh, uh, which uh, was very clear. This was an issue which Abdul Azim should have uh, should have uh, not, yeah, not only uh, stopped the, should have stopped the, the, the transaction itself and uh, and then the claim any amount due under this this limit. But on the contrary, what he did is that he extended the, the, the limit to them. <clears throat> well, he um, certainly he was involved in the extension of the credit to that of that right. amount. Right, Your Honour. Um, I can see that, but um, I think you understand the point that I'm on. Um, how do you prove that that figure of 1.7 million isn't wrapped up? in payments that were made by Merab subsequently to the extension of that um, uh, uh, of that um, figure, the, the, the credit of 1.27 um, and, and what do you say, do you say that this was negligence or what's your cause of action for, for saying that this is recoverable this 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 sum. It, it is neg negligence, Your Honor, and possibly it is more than ne negligence. It is intentional neg negligence, possibly. This is why this is our stand, and uh, whether. It's strictly ne neg negligence, Your Honor. If you want to take it on its face value. Well, the way it's pleaded is a failure to follow the required processes in relation to customer accounts. This is the, the negligence so, we are referring to, Your Honor. Yes. Now, Mr. Bowden, put on one side for a moment whether this claim has properly been pleaded as particulars. Put that on one side for the minute. What's your case for saying that this claim ought not to go to trial? Sorry? Well... The, the first one, sir, is, it, is that there's just simply no evidence of loss. What the applicant says uh, in his witness statement, his second witness statement, in paragraphs 52, so that's page 62 of the bundle, uh, 
Oh, just let me turn that up, please. That's in the application bundle. That's in the application bundle, sir, and that'll be tab 13. At tab 13, paragraph. is it? Tab 13, page 62, yep. sir. Page 62, yes. And, and it really, this, this is the... This is the evidence, sir, which uh, relates to the uh, documents your, your Honour just looked at it, uh, page yes. 120, the same bundle. And, and yes. there, sir, if we go from paragraph 53, it says, secondly, uh, I was not responsible for the transaction, um, and then I annex here to and mark with the letter AE9, which are the, the relevant emails we've just looked at. So yes, we, we were looking at. The customer yep. had an existing line of credit, which the chairman had initially organized, uh, authorised. Um, the, a problem has arisen, had arisen, not that the customer had exceeded the credit limit, but just that they hadn't made a payment on time, so the, the internal processes had kicked in, sir. Um, he, he then says, well, I was, I was one of three senior people who endorsed this decision. Yes. Uh, I wasn't the maker of it. Um, no. and, and then he goes on to say, at, at some length, I think, sir, in some detail over the next page, uh, that actually there, there, wasn't, there was no loss arising from it. Um, and then, sir, we turn back to the point that Your Honour just touched on, and, and that is, what is the basis of this claim? Now, it, it said, sir... Well, it's said generally in relation to the Ernst & Young report that that's a fiduciary claim, sir. But, of course, this claim wasn't dealt with in the uh, Ernst & Young report. And I think it's well known that in an employment relationship, some, some matters might be uh, construed as fiduciary, uh, but matters such as this, sir, where he's in the... This is uh, not fiduciary. Or, exactly. Sir. This is not fiduciary. This is a matter of whether or not... Uh, it, it's a matter of competence. Did he it's, fall below the standard to be expected of someone occupying his position within the company? But it's not a fiduciary claim. But I can see that it would be an implied term to exercise reasonable care in the course of his employment. Uh, so, and it could be said that um, there was a a want of sufficient care in granting this credit. There, there may be, sir, a, a lawyer who's skilled enough to recast this in such a way that it, that it um, makes a, a claim, sir, but it, as it's currently uh, cast, sir, it, it can't. Um, the, the claims of negligence, sir, were, were struck out, and not by Gibson Dunn, sir, but by... By Mr. Mitchley for BSA, sir. He yes. struck those out. And he struck those out. For very good reason. Um, and, and namely, that, that there no cause of action can arise in negligence, at least on that base, basis, sir, uh, in an employment setting. And in fact, sir, if we go to page, it's page 21 of the CMC bundle, sir. Page um, 21 of the CMC bundle, 21 yes. Of the CMC bundle. yes. Yes, I'm there. There, sir, that should be, so I'm just getting there myself, uh, the, the actual claims. It's in G, isn't it? Yes, sir. Um, G and H, sir. Well, F, G and H. But if one, if one, looks, at, well, if one looks at F, sir... I, I haven't. I've I've got the book here, but that's no use to you, sir. But the the um, articles eight and nine of the DIFC law of damages, those sir uh, are headed up uh, claims related to the DIFC law of contract. So those are contract damages, sir. But of yeah, course, employment law is, is itself an exclusive code. So the the claim for damages under eight and nine doesn't relate to employment damages. And then if we go to Articles 23 and 24, sir, those relate to damages arising from breach of the law of obligations. And again, sir, 
Uh, those aren't employment damages. So I, I, I just, for the life of me, sir, I can't see yeah, how... Yeah, but this, 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 man, this, this man had a contract of employment. Yes, he did. Didn't he? There's no doubt that the foundation of his relationship with the claimant is in contract. An and um, it, it would be readily implied into a contract such as this that um, the employee is to um, carry out his functions um, exercising um, reasonable care and competence. Yes, sir. And he's acting within the scope of his actual authority. He's, no one says that he wasn't. And so it then becomes uh, a matter of ostensible authority that the, the employer carries the, carries the loss. I don't understand no. your authority point with respect. I think it's... Um, uh, unless, your, unless your contention is that what he was doing was within the scope of his remit, given his position in the company... And that would be an answer to a claim that he's, ex um, he's exceeded his remit because this showed a want of competence and commercial judgment. Well, well, well he, he was within his remit, sir, and he's one of three senior managers looking at this, and they yes. all of them, um, and, and, on, and on matters go for several years. Uh, it's surprising that this matter is identified uh, a long way down the track. And, 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 and it was only ever pleaded to, you, Your Honour pointed to it, a, as an example. Um, yet it's fitted in uh, into the claim for relief uh, as a sum owed. Um, it, again, sir, it fits within the, the earlier examples of the 1.7 million and 1.4 million. It might be said, we deny it of course, but it might be said, sir, that he... He, he was properly dismissed for going um, beyond his remit or acting outside of the co internal company controls for, for doing those things. And this yes. suit might be an example of that, but it doesn't give rise to a freestanding claim. Well, I, Your Honor, I, I, I'll tell you what my ruling is. Your Honor, if I'm... I'm going to give... One... Wait a moment... <coughs> I'm going to give the claimant the opportunity to replead a claim in respect of this extension of credit. And uh, it, so these particulars will be, a line will go through them, and there'll be a fresh claim which uh, I think is ar it's, it's arguable, no more than that, it's arguable that Mr. El Fadl's um, participation in the extension of credit to this extent was in breach of an implied duty of um, reasonable care and uh, competence to be expected of an employee occupying his position and there must be particulars of how the loss arises and I think that can go to trial now this claim is sought to be deployed as a set-off against the monetary claims which are being made by um, Mr. El Fadil. And I'll come to that um, later, just to let you into my thinking at the moment. Uh, I do not think that it is a sufficiently cogent and convincing claim to give rise 
to a set-off. I think there are problems with this claim, particularly in the establishment of loss. And so although I am going to allow the claim to go to trial, with respect to any money claims, we haven't come on to them yet, any money claims of Mr. El Fadil which I um, grant, to the extent they overtop the 1.7 million, then there can be no question of any set-off or anything of the like. Uh, to the extent they do not overtop the 1.7 million, I'm going to require the claimant company to bring the money into court because I regard this claim, which I'm allowing to go to trial, as a rather unconvincing claim um, about which there are, I think, some difficulties, some considerable difficulties. But there's enough there to go to trial. So those who are taking a note as we go along will please note that, that the claimant is given leave to plead a freestanding claim for breach of contract, an implied term, in respect of the grant of this credit. Details, particulars, must be given of how the loss arises. The claimant must pay the costs incurred by the defendant in answering this claim, the original claim in the particulars was not within the leave that was granted at the CMC. This was an illegitimate use of particulars to make this claim. And so, although the defendant will have leave to plead it out properly, the uh, cost of responding to that claim will be a cost payable by the defendant to the counterclaimant. Right. Uh, Your Honour, if, if I may... Okay. Yes. If I may draw your attention to CMC, page 27. 27, uh, yes. Uh, you, you would uh, notice, Your Honor, that this is uh, the violation is not restricted to the contractual relationship, but also it is uh, extended to the violation of the credit policy and. Pre uh, uh, and uh, uh, pro 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 procedures. So it's not only a, a violation of one contract, it's a violation of certain rules and regulations in the company itself. So this is what we are going to elaborate on during the yes, trial. Yes, but you Your see, yeah, I understand, I understand that, but the relationship between your client and Mr. El Fadil is essentially one of contract. Now, it may be a breach of contract, but he has not complied with procedures. You can, it's arguable that he, there was an implied term in the contract that he would comply with established procedures that were operating within the company, but it all comes back to a claiming contract. It's open to you to plead that he, he was contractually obliged to comply with procedures. So I think of course, you, you, you need have no concern about that, all right? Yes, of course, Your Honor. All right. It's, it's well un so understood. So let's get on to um, the fifth claim, which is in respect of 820,585 dirhams plus interest. Now, this is claimed at paragraph 13. Mm 
of, um, of, of the counterclaim. And if you go to page 30 of the CMC bundle, Paragraph 13 at the top of the page, additional financial payment rights due to the claimant. And then we see how the figure of 820,585 is arrived at. It's reimbursement of amounts paid on behalf of the defendant plus business trip expenses. So that's the claim. Now, <clears throat> the claim, save for Swiss francs 10,000, is admitted. If we look at um, page 92 of the application bundle, This is the second page of Gibson Dunn's letter. Under the heading amounts admitted as owing to the defendant, you will see there that there's a, 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 an admission as to the business trip expenditure of 67,000 odd and an admission as to 715,000 dirhams, but a non-admission and a denial as to the Swiss francs of 10,000. Now let's put the Swiss francs of 10,000 on one side for the moment. It appears to me, but I want to hear from Mr. Cannon, that this is a clear admission that the sums are 67,193 and 715,621 AED are admitted, subject, no doubt, to an attempt to set off the Mirab claim. These are admitted sums. Yes, Your Honor, they now, are admitted Mr. Cannon, sums. what do you say? Yes, they are admitted sums, Your Honor. By right. earlier by Gibson and Dunn. So we accept this, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much. So shall we move on to the Swiss francs? Now, if you look at page 91 of the CMC bundle. We looked at this earlier, if you're with me. It's Annex yes, 2. Right. Now, originally, the 10,000 Swiss francs were admitted. They're yes, in table B1. Yeah, it but is they admitted. were then, then a line put through them, and they appear in part B. 10,000 Swiss francs. Now, Mr. Cannon, I'm sure you know that any admission that is made in a pleading can only be resiled with the permission of the court. Yes, Your Honour. And so far as I'm aware, the court has never granted permission for we, we, we the abandonment of this admission. Permission now. 
We see you have permission now, Your Honor. Well, that's too. That's that's a very cavalier approach to take to this point. This was something that should have been done um, before this line was put through the Swiss francs. Um, the door of my court has just opened by a puff of wind or something. I'm just going to get up and shut the door. I'm not departing. Okay, just give me a moment. Well, Mr. Cannon, what's the, what's the justification for allowing you? Why should you be allowed to abandon this admission and make a claim in respect of the 10,000 Swiss francs? Or at least advance a defence, not so much make a claim, yeah, but to uh, advance a defence. Yeah, because now we have found, you know, we got to know of, of, uh, of further evidence regarding this amount. Well, where so is this, this evidence? Was not, this was not uh, available at the time the, uh, the memo was made, at the time the earlier uh, memo was made. Well, that's strange because there's a support document A9, which is referred to in table B1. And the same document is referred to <laughs> in the denied claim in Part B. What's going on? This was found in the statement of accounts which have been received thereafter. It's in the, in the statement well, where is of account. It? But there is no there, there is no supporting document uh, in the, regarding the invoices which had been raised. There, there was no raised. Oh, well, sorry. Invoices. Where is where is document A nine? It's not in, in our position, Your Honour. No. Now, would you, would you please go to page 150 in the CMC bundle? Well, it's 151, actually. Page 151. Now, this is a copy of Mr. El Fadil's bank statement with HSBC, his HSBC Premier Bank statement. And the first entry reads Rotana expenses. Landolt Stewer, and something else in German, Rotana AG expenses, personal expenses, 10,000 Swiss francs. So that's the payment that he this made. The... Sorry, Your Honor. Yeah. Uh, this is the, the, a, a bank statement, Your Honor. It's not, yes. it's, it's not supported. Only a bank statement that is, that uh, this had been uh, uh, it's put in the bank statement. It's not an invoice. Any. It, there is no su supporting documents to, to this payment. Come on, Mr. Canan. This is a 
bank statement issued by a highly reputable bank yep, that is we recording are not denying a the bank statement. Let me finish recording a payment made in the sum of 10,000 Swiss francs to this um, individual in respect of Rotana expenses. And Mr. El Fadil uh, says in his um, witness statement that Mr. Robert Landbolt was the chairman's agent in Switzerland and the expenses refer to Rotana Capital AG, which is the chairman's company. Now, there's been no answer to that evidence that's been served by Mr. El Fadil. Yeah, but there is no sanction for, from, from the chairman, Your Honor. This is what Mr. Abdul Azim is saying. Well, why is that any defense to a claim for reimbursement? This is money that has gone from Mr. El Fadil's account into the hands of the chairman's agent. It is clearly on the evidence for the purposes of the chairman in respect of Rotana Capital AG. And it may be that there's some paperwork missing But how can there be any defense to a claim that this sum should be reimbursed Mr. El Fadil? It's come from his bank account and it was for the chairman's purposes in respect of Rotana Capital AG, which was the chairman's company. You're not denying that Rotana Capital AG is the chairman's company, are you? Yes, of course it is, Your Honor. It is the the, the, the company of Rotana is, is one of the group company. Is, 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 con is one of the chairman's companies. Yes, of course we agree to this. Yeah. But what we are trying to say, Your Honor, is that this is, this is a, a, an issue which is by violation uh, of the, uh, and it's a breach of, the, of, of his obligation. The, this amount of uh, which was paid, which shows on uh, on his statement of account, it's important to be to to relate it, to relate this amount to a certain document, which is not there. The, this is why we believe it, it can be can be looked at at the trial. Well, answer me this: Who has had the benefit? of these 10,000 Swiss francs? The, the, the chairman, Your Honor. Yes. Now this may be a breach of procedures, protocols, or whatever that you may wish to advance together with the other matters you wish to advance to justify dismissal for cause. Yes, Your Honour. But I can see no defence to this claim for 10,000 Swiss francs. It is plainly due. It was plainly paid for and on behalf of the chairman and uh, the company must reimburse Mr. Al Fadil. We, we agree, Your Chairman. This is not the issue in, in our opinion. The issue who authorized Abdul Azim to pay this amount, if any. There should be. Why an is that a defense? Because of, the, of, of, of his obligations under Article 160 of the Law of Obligations. Well, is, is the chairman going to return this money? This is what we need to, uh, Yanni. If this money is paid on behalf of the chairman, there should be first, this is, 
If it is a German expenses, personal expenses, is one thing. If it's a TIG expenses, it's a different thing, Your Honor. So we need to know what is the supporting document for, 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 for this payment. Because we have to, to make the distinction here between uh, payments made by Abdul Azim for personal expenses of Sheikh, uh, of Sheikh, of the chairman, which then requires a supporting document. And that is clear, that is uh, requested to do this. Yes, very well. Well, in my judgment, on the state of the evidence before me, which includes a witness statement signed by Mr. Al Fadil, which has not been um, contradicted by the defendant, it is not denied that this payment has gone in respect of expenses incurred in relation to the chairman's company. The bank statement is clearly a genuine um, statement and record. And I judge that there is no defense to the claim for 10,000 Swiss francs. And accordingly, subject to the Marab um, counterclaim, um, I propose to give judgment for the claim that is made in Claim 5. Now, interest is also sought in respect of that. Mr. Cannon, the interest is at 9% and the daily rate is, um, is, is um, specified in the um, skeleton arguments and the, um, the, uh, the witness statement. Do you have anything to say about the interest which is claimed? Yes, Your Honor. The interest rate, the prevailing interest rate, even in Europe or wherever it is, it is not more than one or two percent or maximum three percent while he is claiming an interest of nine percent for for no reason but what's the borrowing rate mr canan the, yeah, the, but yeah it, it is I mean, less than than three percent your honor the borrowing you mean you depends can borrow? on, on where, it depends on on where the the borrowing has taken place because if you, uh, if the borrowing is in, in Switzerland itself, the, the rate is not more than 3%. Well, supposing the borrowing now, was in, in, in the um, uh, a, a, in UAE. UAE, yes, forgive me. Right. Uh, What's the usual UAE, borrowing rate it, it's in the UAE? Supposed to be, it's, it's, uh, it's Iber plus 1.63. At, uh, sorry, it's Iber at 1.63 to 2.265. Uh, uh, this is the maximum. The which is far the lower than which is far lower than, than the nine percent he's claiming. Uh, yes, I see. Well, Mr. Bowden, what do you say about the interest rate? Uh, we've claimed it according to the practice direction, sir. And my associate's just going to remind me which one it is. The, the, the practice direction says 9%, sir. It was e PD 4 bar 7, 2017, sir. Well, you'll have to show me a document. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that I haven't dealt with it in my... Uh, that, that's the DIFC 
practice direction sir 4 bar 2017 specifies that it's nine percent from the date of that practice direction and that's under uh, the, the entitlement to interest is is that under which are difc law is it that gives an entitlement to interest I believe it's a judicial authority or the court, DIFC courts law. If I can just come back to you on that. It's one, it's one or the other, sir. Well, well let's leave. Uh, um, there's clearly a dispute about interest. And at the moment, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave interest over. But as I've said, I am going to give judgment for the principal sums which uh, together amount to um, 820,585. And, and we'll, we'll discuss what we do about interest um, later. Now the next claim, claim six, is in respect of unpaid salary. And that's um, a sum of 84,333. And if we look at page 96 of the application bundle, This is the Gibson Dunn letter, and it's paragraph D. It reads, regarding the claim for unpaid April salary, 84333, the defendant's entitlements at termination must be set off against any amount owing from the defendant. And the Merab claim is specified. So there's no denial there that the sum is due, but what is sought to be argued is that there's a, a set-off on the basis of the Merat claim. So I, I take it, Mr. Cannon, that it is accepted that this salary claim is a good claim, but it's subject to the set-off. Is that right? Exactly. Of course, no. yeah. Okay. We confirm. Okay. Well, what I'm going to um, what I'm going to say, both in respect of this claim and of the um, the claim that we've just uh, dealt with, which was for the A twenty five eight five. These claims together don't overtop the 1.7 million claim for Merab. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to direct that the defendant must pay into court within a period of time we will discuss the sums claimed in claim five without, so for the moment, the interest and the unpaid salary. And they can counterclaim on the basis of Merab at the trial if the sums are not paid into court within the specified time, then judgment will be entered for those sums. Now, um, we come to claim seven, the holiday pay. Um, Mr. Bowden... Yes, 
I'm looking at your latest skeleton, Mr. Bowden. You, you say that this is an undisputed claim for 29 days vacation leave, and you cite this exhibit, which I raised right at the beginning of the hearing. Indeed, sir. And we've, um, now, have we made any to... progress? Yes, yes, I have made some progress on that. I, and I do apologise, sir. That was uh, my mistaken uh, citation, sir. But having said that, um, the correct citation, sir, should be well. Well, if, if we can, if I can just take you, sir, to Mr. El Fadel's uh, witness statement at tab 13, sir. All right, we'll look at that. Wait a moment. Let's just turn it up. Tab 13, yes. Which paragraph? Uh, paragraph 73, or page 66 of the 66. Paragraph, yes, page, uh, page 66. 66. Exactly, sir. Yeah. Right. Now, this, this was the document which was um, incorrectly cited. I'm sorry, um, at my page 66, it, it's all to do with the tort of abuse of process. Oh. Can I take you back to paragraph 20, 73, sir? 73, yes. Paragraph 73. Yes. Yeah. And here's there's a reference to AE 2.8, which doesn't work. Yes, and that, that is my mistaken reference, sir. I apologise for that. Uh, that reference was, was wrong. What is written there, though, sir, and, and, and indeed, sir, the source document is not in the evidence. Uh, mistakenly, I put a different document in it, page, uh, at AE 2.8. My mistake. However, um, this is what the document said, and, and I, my explanation is here, I, I copy typed it from documents that my client has given to me, uh, and then when we sorted out the documents at the end, clearly I made an error, and, and it's the wrong one, sir. However, um, there is sufficient proof in the documents for, for which I'll take you to. So this is, this yes. is what the document said. We're happy to provide it, sir. Um, we can send it through after the hearing, and it says. Have you got it in court? Uh, well, yes. My, my, only from my client, sir. I gathered up some hard copy documents from my client uh, when we were drafting this witness statement, sir. Uh, and I'd have to obtain it from my client again, sir. But yes, we can get it in very short order, sir. It's in okay. Computers. All right. Well, shall we, right. shall so, we move on and wait for oh, the availability right, but, but, of this uh, document? There's, there's, another, there's another document which, which makes the same point, sir. And yes. that is the CMC bundle at page 86. Yes. Small row, point two, small row, numerals two. Yes. And the defence counterclaim. Yes. And you should see there, Sue, the admission that the sum of one hundred and four thousand eight hundred and seventy six is owing. Now that is in relation yes. to the same twenty nine days of holiday pay, sir. Y yes. But Mr. El Fadel says in his witness statement, sir, that that is wrongly calculated. So that is the difference between 104,000, which the claimant admits to, and the 153,000, which Mr. El Fadel 
plants. Well, um, looking at your skeleton argument, this is claim seven. Is it? Yes, he's claiming 153. Yes, he says that 29 days equals 153. The claimant says 100. Uh, sorry, 29 days equals 104. That being the difference in the calculation. Well, how are we going to resolve this? Well, um, Miss, in, in the skeleton, sir, and indeed in, in the witness statement. Um, well, if we take the witness statement, sir, what Mr. Alfardel says is even though the calculation is incorrect, it should be AED 153 on the basis that the claimant admits I am owed 104, I claim that sum. So what Mr. Alfardel said in his evidence, sir, um, what was the lower sum, and I, I believe, sir, when I wrote the skeleton I got a little more ambitious, and uh, decided that he would be entitled to the higher sum, sir. But uh, uh, perhaps I, I overreached there, and we should go with what the evidence says, sir. So, to, yes. if I'm not making sense, sir, I'll reduce it to 104,000 uh, for the sake of getting on, sir. And now, is the, that... Is it, does that does, what happens to the balance? Are you going to... Seek the balance well, at trial, or are you foregoing the balance, yes, the difference between yes. 104 no, and 153? No, because Mr. Al Fadel says that he was in fact owed 180 days, um, going right back to, to his time in, in Saudi Arabia, sir. So that is a matter for trial. So it's, it's, a, it's an on, on account, sir. I'm so sorry, it was a little bit fuzzy, the, um, the, the, uh, the sound there. So, so what, what's the position? You, you seek the admitted sum of 104,000, yes, yes, and sir. as to any additional sum for holiday pay, uh, you'll seek to recover that at the trial, is that it? Correct, sir. And, and if you see at pay para 73 of yep. the witness statement, AE2, yep. he says there, I, I claim for 180 days. Of vacation leave. Yes. So yes, and, I see. and that is, yeah, and that is disputed, sir. And we accept yeah, that. that's all that's disputed. Yes. Okay. So thank you, well, Mr. Cannon. The the position is that today the defendant counterclaimant is seeking the admitted sum, and anything over and above that will go for trial. Now, what do you say? I mean, you have your your um, your client has admitted. Yes, in, your client, um, the client has admitted uh, regarding the one zero four. Yeah. However, the, we are of the opinion that there is the uh, the the, con the contractual uh, the contracts employment contract signed between both parties would prevent any accumulation of leave. So this is why we are saying, oh, but, if, but when the client admits, then it admits it's okay. Yes. And we okay. don't have an objection to this. No. But we no. are of the opinion that this amount is not due because of the, of the accumulation is not permitted of, of leave according to the contract. Very well. Well, I understand your position, Mr. Cannon. But um, <laughs> the, the, admission, um, uh, the, the admission is there, and um, it stands. And so I'm going to <laughs> make the same order I've made in respect of other claims, that the sum of 104,876.71 <laughs> must be paid into court. Um, <laughs> and uh, that will then... Uh, depend on the outcome of the Merab counterclaim. <coughs> uh, 
and if it isn't paid into court within the time I specify, um, then a judgment will be entered. <coughs> now, I want you to excuse me for... A, 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 no water has been provided in this room in London, and I've been doing a lot of talking, and I just need a glass of water. So would you excuse me for two minutes while I get some water and then we'll carry on? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now we come to the penalty. Now, Mr. Uh, Bowden, I want you to make submissions here. Are we under the, the new employment law of 2019, or are we under the old employment law number four? We're, we're under the old law, sir. Why? Um, because the new law came into effect in, I believe, September 2019, sir. Yes. But... Um, when one looks at uh, the opening wording of the new law, it's not clear to me that this is the new, uh, whether or not the new law in fact takes over, subject to only an exception in respect of Article 19.4 of the new law. Have you got the new law there? Um. Not immediately, sir, but I was looking at it this morning, so... Well, does Mr. Cannon have the new law, the employment law in court? Uh, I don't have it with me now, Your Honour, but I can, I can comment as follows. The, the earlier law was uh, uh, referred to Article 18.1, as a question of, of penalty for not satisfying the, the payment of the salaries and other issues in due course. However, yes. uh, the application for, 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 for applying 18.1 has been made in November 2019. If we, if we look at the dates, we will find out, Your Honor, that the uh, the enactment the <clears throat> the law was uh, signed on 20th May uh, to, uh, 20, on the yes on on 20th May uh, yeah, 2018 in, in May in May 2019 but yes the, uh, was enacted in August 2019 came into effect in August. Yes, 28 yes. August 2019, while the yes. application was made on November 2019. This is yes. beyond the, the allowed six-month the, the delay period as stipulated in Article, in article 10. It's, which says article 10 of the period. old law? So sorry, forgive me. Yes, I'm, of, I'm, uh, of the, old law or new, new law, law Article 10? Yes, of the new law, Your Honor. Of, of the new law. I'm, I'm just looking it yes. up. Yeah. 
subject may, may I read it to you? May I read it, Your Honor? So it has to be within six months, six months of the best. relevant employee's termination date. Yes, Your Honor. But the application was made thereafter, in November. And it's the termination date. Does that depend on whether there was <coughs> instant termination for good cause or whether or not um, there was a period of, of notice that had to expire before the contract terminated? Uh, to our knowledge, Your Honor, we, uh, it is uh, evidence that he has first, in the beginning, he has submitted his, uh, his res resignation uh, from the service of the company. And thereafter, the company terminated his services on uh, 24 uh, April 2018. So this first he has resigned and then his services was terminated for, for cause. Yes. yes. So this is, this yeah, this has happened a, a year before, Yanni. This is in 2018. Yes. Now he is coming in, in, in November 2019 to submit to, to his, his application uh, for, for, the, for the penalties uh, under an earlier law which, is, which has expired already. Uh, yeah, if the application was already submitted earlier to the to the prescribed period, then it may it may be subject to, it, to your uh, uh, decision, Your Honour. Yes, and I follow what you say. I'm just having a look at the um, the, the the counterclaim. Um, it's. Um, it begins, the first pleading we've got is in the CMC at tab three, and it ends up page 22. We looked at this earlier. And the original claim, oh, I'm sorry, no, that's, um, that, I've, I've made a mistake there, forgive me. The, the defendant's amended counterclaim, um, it starts at page 23, and it was first issued, yes, in November, 8th of November, 2018. Exactly, Your Honor. And that's, you, that's more than six months after what you say was dismissal for just cause. Exactly, Your Honour. I follow. Yeah. Well, what do you say, Mr. Bowden? Well, sir, firstly, uh, the penalty was sought... Sorry, do you hear me? My first point, sir, is that the penalty was in fact sought in November 2018. So within yes. the currency of the old law... Uh, and in respect of the old law, there was no limitation period, or the six-year limitation period. So, so uh, firstly, sir, under the old law, the six-month employment limitation period did not apply. It was six years uh, in accordance with the, with the usual law. The second point is that Mr El Fadel made application for a penalty in November of 2018, sir, before the new law came in. Uh, and thirdly, sir, I think that the situation is in any event dealt with under Article 1, uh, brackets 3 of the new law. Yes, I'm just looking says, at that. Without limiting the generality of Article 1, bracket 2, above, and subject only to Articles 1 brackets 4, 1 brackets 5, 10, and 61 brackets 2, uh, the repeal and replacement under Article 1.1 1 .1 brackets 1 shall not affect any right, remedy, debt, or obligation accrued or incurred by any person or any legal 
proceeding commenced or to be commenced in respect of any such right, remedy, debt or obligation under the previous law. And any such legal proceeding must be instituted, continued or enforced, including any relevantly served penalty, uh, fine or forfeiture under this law without prejudice to any right, remedy, debt or obligation which has accrued or incurred prior to the commencement of this law. So I, my submission says well, that... Well, shall we look at four, subsection, sub, sub, uh, paragraph four, where there's no equivalent provision in this law to a provision in the previous law, the relevant provision in the previous law is deemed to survive the repeal and replacement yes. until such time as necessary for the purposes of any legal proceeding specified in Article 13b. The fact that a provision in this law reduces or extinguishes its rights in the previous law does not prevent it from being an equivalent provision. And then in 5, for the purposes of 1.3, a claim in respect of any part of a penalty due pursuant to Article 19.2, which would otherwise be excluded by Article 19.4, may be brought prior to the commencement of this law. So if we go to Article 19, This is payments following termination. And then in, sub sub par in paragraph 2, subject to 19, 3 and 4, an employee should be entitled to and the employer should pay a penalty equal to the employee's daily wage. And then 3, a penalty may only be awarded if the amount are not paid in accordance with 19.1, and, and then four, a penalty pursuant to 19.2 will be waived by a court in respect of any period during which a dispute is pending in the court regarding any amount, and be the employee's re unreasonable conduct. I'm a little confused, I have to confess. Going back to Article 1, Article 1.3, which you've just uh, drawn to my attention, Mr. Bowden, without limiting the generality of 1.2 and subject to 1.4.5.10 and 61.2, the repeal and replacement shall not affect any right remedy debt accrued to or incurred by or any legal proceeding commenced under the previous law. Now, have we, do we need to check off Articles 1, 4, 5, 10 and 61, 2? Well, you read Article 10. My, my submission, sir, is that Article 1.3 stands alone and in favour of the claim as it exists now, uh, and that Articles 1, 4, 1, 5, and no part of 19 derogates from it. Uh, in other words, sir, we're, we're in a situation where it's, it's a mandatory, still a mandatory penalty, as under the old law. Otherwise, sir, it moves into a uh, discretionary penalty under the new law. But what about 1.4? 1.3 is subject to 1.4, and 1.4 says where there is no equivalent provision in this law, the relevant provision in the previous law is deemed to survive... The fact that a provision in this law reduces or extinguishes rights in the previous law does not prevent it from being an equivalent provision. 
And so is, isn't there an argument that there is an equivalent provision in the new law, which is in Article 19? Yes. Uh, Your Honour. Yes. The way, the way I read one brackets four with respect, sir, is that it, it allows the previous provision to survive. It, it keeps it going. Well, that's where there's so, no yes, there is a there is a provision. A, there is an equivalent provision, sir. Eight, 18, the old 18 and the new 19 are pro equivalent provisions. Well, isn't that your last... difficulty? Because the opening words of, sub, of paragraph 4 are, where there is no equivalent provision, the relevant provision in the previous law is deemed to survive. So you carry on with the previous law if there is no equivalent in the new law. But isn't there an equivalent in the new law under Article 19? Yes, I believe there is. But, but reading the sentence as a whole, sir, so where there is no equivalent provision in this law, the relevant provision in the previous law is deemed to survive the repeal and replacement until such time as necessary for the purpose of any legal proceeding specified under 13b, i.e. the existing one. So it, it preserves a proceeding which had started prior to the new law coming into effect on the 28th of August 2019, sir, and luckily um, it appears that Mr El Fadel had claimed the penalty from November 2018. Well, he certainly did that. But the... Well, look, gentlemen, I'm finding this very difficult. I think we need more time and more research to look into this problem. It may be that Mr. Cannon's submission is correct, and so the, new, the limitation period um, operates. It may be Mr. Bowden's position is correct. Yes, but um, I, I think that for the purposes of today, we should adjourn the application for penalty and um, probably put it over to trial <coughs> um, because we ought to get this trial on as quickly as we can and we don't really want to have a further interlocutory hearing prior to trial. Um, we ought really to get as a speedier timetable in place for a trial, and that this, this claim could be made in a trial when everyone's had a chance to <coughs> take on board this wording. And then he, there must be some written commentary on this. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you say, gentlemen? Uh, in, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, Your Honour, it is this all is subject to. To, actual, to, uh, to Article 19.2, which says the employee's unreasonable conduct is the, is, the material, uh, is the material cause of the employment failing to, uh, to, to, to receive, uh, to, to re receive an amount uh, uh, due from the, from the employer. This is, so this is the article which refers to unreasonable. And it's clear in, uh, in, in this context that there was unreasonable conduct from, uh, from Abdul Azim. On the other hand, also, Your, your Honor, we would look at Article, uh, at Article 10, which governs actually this issue, which says without, uh, without limiting the generality of Article 1, 2, and uh, subject only to Articles 1, 4, 1, 5, 10, 
We are looking at Article 10, Your Honor. Article yes. 10, it calls for limitation, period, where it says, subject to Article 16, 61.2, a court shall not consider a claim under this law unless it is brought to the court with, within a six months of the relevant employee, employee's termination date. So this, uh, this had been brought to the attention of the court at a date much later than, than, the, than the limitation referred to under Article 10. This is what, yes. what we are trying to... And I think it is a clear-cut uh, article, uh, Your Honor, uh, in, in, in this regard, which has no equivalent under the... the, 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 that, the old, uh, that the earlier uh, uh, provision of Article 18 has no equi equivalent under the, 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 the new law. What, well, I follow what you say. But I, I feel that it would be premature at this stage to make a final determination on this issue. Um, this you. is a difficult point. And what I think I'm inclined to do is to say that this, the claim for um, penalty will not be decided today. Um, it will be decided at trial and there must be full argument on the effect of the new and the old law. And you know, sometimes before a new law is enacted, there is a con consultation document which is published, which can help the court get at the meaning of the new law. And um, I don't know whether there was such a consultation document. Uh, I think uh, you'll all have experience in other areas of, of where DIFC law is being um, considered for amendment. There is consultation and sometimes there's a report and the report can be very helpful in getting at the intention behind the new law. So I'm going to adjourn. Well, I'm going to direct that the unpaid salary claim is to be determined at trial, where the court will have the benefit of full argument. The arguments that Mr. Cannon made will be made at trial, and Mr. Bowden's arguments, and the court... Um, will have the opportunity of, um, if you like, further research and further reflection. So that's my ruling on um, penalty. If I could just say something soon. Um, I, I think my respectful suggestion is that it fits within uh, RDC 24.1. The immediate judge, the immediate judgment rule says uh, no other good reason or other good reason why it should go to trial. So that is a good reason why it should go to trial. All right. Uh, just a, okay. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Yes. Nothing else to say. Thank you. Sir. Right. So this issue will come back for full consideration at trial. And I'm not going to decide it now. I'm, I'm not going to make any... I'm not going to decide this claim. It's, it's, um, it wouldn't be right. Well, now, the ninth application is to um, include a new cause of action for abuse of process. And the tenth is for a new cause of action for malicious prosecution. Then the 11th is for security for costs. And, um, I, I, and I think <laughs> then there's some sweeping up as to some outstanding, um, outstanding matters. Um, well, now, Mr. Bowden, you have set out in some detail your contentions for why you should have permission to include a new claim for abuse of process 
and for malicious prosecution. And uh, Mr. Cannon will have had the opportunity of studying and reading that. So I'm going to ask Mr. Cannon, what do you say about this application for permission to introduce these new claims, cause of action of abuse of process and malicious prosecution, Mr. Cannon? Uh, Your Honor, this, uh, our, this uh, application had been put in a later stage, which did not allow us time to consider or to respond to. Therefore, we would suggest to, it, to Your Honor that this moves to the, to the trial also. Well, the problem with that is that um, the, 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 the trial may not be an effective resolution of all the issues in the case because the, if the parties don't know whether permission is going to be given for these claims for trial they may have to get ready for these claims which are then disallowed at the, um, at the trial stage so I, 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 I find that an unattractive approach I, I mean the, the, the um, the application for dealing with these claims was issued some time ago, wasn't it? Mr. Bowden, in your application for these matters which we're now dealing with today, um, your original application included an application for leave to make these amendments, is that correct? Yes, it did, sir, on the 11th of November, and Mr. El Fadel's witness statement set out uh, the, the claim. Um, can you just show me where the um, notice of application is in the bundle? Yes, sir. It's in bundle one. Yeah. At, under tab 11, sir. Tab 11. Well, can we all look at that, please? Um, about two-thirds of the way down on the second page, it's on page 42, there's an application for leave to be granted to amend the existing claim to add a cause of action for abuse of process and for malicious prosecution, and for security for costs. And this was issued on the 12th of November. So it's about three months since this was issued. Your Honor, we believe that there is no abuse of process in the first place. And this, uh, this issue, because this relates to what has happened earlier during the, the course of the criminal proceedings at that time, etc. So we didn't have enough time to, to go through these, these processes that happened earlier. And there, and accordingly, we were not able to go through every each, uh, uh, each argument that had been raised in this regard. And, but, but on the face value of the things, definitely there was no abuse of process because the, the earlier claim, the earlier uh, uh, process, uh, process was based on the understanding that there is uh, uh, the, the dishonesty and there is issues that really has triggered the, 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 the earlier cost of, of action. Now, in order to explain all this and to put our point of view regarding these issues, I believe this, this, was, this, this can, could not have been the, the, the subject of, of any application at this point of time. 
But we can look at it at the, at, at the trial, Your Honor. And we can give all the justifications what happened. Well, yeah, and um, they, they should not be a part of these proceedings in the first place. Well, the normal way for claims to be enlarged is to make an application to the court for permission to enlarge the claim and to set out um, what the contention is as to whether there's enough in the claim for the court to give permission. If the court gives permission, it's not deciding the claim, it's simply allowing the claim to go ahead and the claim can be defended, it can be vigorously defended. Now you had notice of these um, of the application to introduce these claims uh, three months ago and Mr. El Fadil's um, witness statement in support is dated the 11th of November. So you've had three months to consider uh, what he said in um, his witness statement about these claims. And I'm afraid I'm not persuaded that um, there's a good case for saying you haven't had sufficient time to consider the question. What you're considering is not whether it's a claim that's bound to fail. What you're considering is whether there is sufficient before the court for the court to give permission for the claim to be made. And if the court thinks there is, then you will have time before the trial comes on to uh, defend the claim and to marshal your evidence accordingly. And the claim, if its permission is given, the claim is going to have to be very carefully pleaded with full particularity because these are serious claims. A claim for abuse of process and, and a claim for malicious prosecution are not claims that should be lightly made. They should be, um, in, in the ordinary way, the court would have wanted a draft pleading, Mr. Bowden. And you, you don't come to the court with a draft pleading, do you? Yes, I do, sir. Where Sorry, is it? It's uh, the schedule to the uh, skeleton. So that will be under tab, tab 16, uh, page 158. So this is your most recent skeleton? Yeah, skeleton argument. Oh. This is skeleton argument. Okay, well, I'm looking at the. Ah, yes, sir, and in there. Yes, amended and draft counterclaim. It, yes, sorry. Yes, exactly. Yes, sir. You're, so you're I've, right. I've actually um, bundled up all of the what what I expected would be the remaining claims, or what I hoped, sir, would be the remaining claims. Unfortunately, there's one or two more that are going to have to be added, uh, such as the penalty, sir. Uh, and in terms of, it starts at counterclaim number five at the bottom of page 160, sir, the tort of abusive process, and counterclaim six, sir, on page 162, the tort of malicious prosecution. Okay, I just want to have a look at that.
Yeah. Yes. Uh, forgive me, I had um, overlooked that. I, had, I have, in fact, seen this before, uh, but there's been a lot of documents for me to keep in mind. So the, the, um, the abuse of process is in respect of the civil proceedings, seeking... Um, seeking judgment in default and so on. Yes, sir. And the malicious prosecution is in respect of the complaint to the police. Yes. Yes. Your Honor, if well, I it's may a high... comment... Uh, just, just one minute and then of course you can. Mr. Bowden, it's a high burden you incur because you have to say that the, the claimant, the company, has acted with the intention of inflicting harm. Yes. Which is a very serious allegation. Um, it's akin to alleging fraud. Yes. And it, these allegations should only be made after very careful consideration by the lawyer who is going to be drafting the claim. And I take it that um, you personally are in charge of this piece of litigation, is that right? Yes, I am, sir. And you've given due thought and um, care to whether there is a proper basis for this very serious allegation of you? Yes, because the claimant knew that these sums were not owing at all times. And indeed, sir, that is what the expert who was appointed by the rulers' court to investigate this matter found, as a, as a matter of fact. Obviously, that's, that's a, in a different proceeding, um, but that is the evidential basis for the claim. That, that it was, well, that's malicious. It was that's the malicious prosecution. Yes, sir. And in relation to the abuse of process again, sir, and we've, we've seen it today, um, that, that the claimant knew uh, that these matters, uh, that these sums were owing uh, at the time that it made the claims in the first place. At least relevantly, the chairman did. Well, you've already been awarded. Wait a minute. You've already been awarded um, the indemnity costs in respect of the application to set aside the judgment. But you say there's been additional damage done, quite apart from incurring the expense in this proceeding to have the default judgment set aside. Well, sir, um, you would... Well, you plead it out, sir, don't you? You say loss of employment, paragraph 12. Yes. Yes. But we do make the same claim, or same prayer for relief, sir, um, I'm just checking, in relation to 17 and... So 12 and 17... Yep. Carry the same prayer for relief. And yeah. it must be said, uh, are, are pleaded concurrently, is the word I finally settled on, meaning that the damages are coexistent, sir. That is true. Well, how do you get to a figure of a million dirhams for general damages? Well... Sir, he, this man was paid, he, he was a very senior employee who had been with the company for 19 years, uh, paid 110,000 dirhams per month. Um, 
this was, it, it was, he, he was, he said in his witness statement, sir, it was, it was very bad for him, sir. He, uh, he, he got, a, he got a, a, in effect, arrested. He was detained at the police station for, for um, only an afternoon, it needs to be said. Um, but he, he was taken there. He didn't know uh, whether uh, he, he was going to get out or not. Um, he did. Uh, his family, uh, he... He has had his family here, so they all had to leave. They've gone to live in Egypt, um, so he's been here uh, by himself. His passport was taken, sir. Uh, he he couldn't get a job um, because he didn't because he didn't have a uh, no object any a no objection certificate, which would allow him to get another job, sir. And his documents were gone. Uh, he he ended up living uh, in somewhat impoverished circumstances, sir. Uh, on the, certainly on the charity of friends, put it that way. Uh, had to leave his home in Dubai, and then he was renting a house in du uh, an apartment in du du Dubai. He couldn't afford that anymore. He was ended up effectively so sl sleeping on a friend's couch in Ajman. Um, before uh, he he did get lucky with the um, uh, expert appointed by the prosecution, sir, uh, and that expert ex exonerated him. But even then, sir. Uh, it's, it's mentioned earlier that after the claimant had admitted in this proceeding that the sums of 1.3 million and 1.4 million were not owing, it persisted with the claim that before the public prosecution uh, that he had stolen those same sums, sir. So it, yes. uh, it's been a difficult situation for them. So, uh, yeah. yes, sir, we have looked very carefully at it. Um, there, there is a, a coexistence in relation to the two claims of abusive process and tort of malicious, malicious prosecution. They do cover, I, I accept, the same ground. Uh, the damages I, I would expect to be set off one against the other. Um, and Your Honour has pointed out... But you want... Uh, you, that you, sorry to interrupt you, Mr Bell, but you, you want <laughs> exemplary damages as well, exemplary damages of half a million and general damages of a million. Well, yes. What's it? What's it worth, sir, to be uh, locked up in these um, circumstances? Uh... But what's the interplay between the general damages and the exemplary damages? Well, in relation to the specific damages uh, sought, sir, um, we have. Damages in relation to the employment, so those are specific damages. General damages serve as a, well, a catch-all, I, I agree. Um, but the, the general damages, in my respect, I have to go back to it, sir. The general damages would cover sir, things of uh, the loss of amenity, the loss of uh, his family being here, uh, the threat to his reputation. Um, and so and then the exemplary damages are served to condemnatory uh, and to uh, punish for the conduct. So that they, they do have separate bases, sir. So one, he's lost his employment uh, and he was out without work for two years. Two, uh, he, he lost his family, he lost his uh, place to live, uh, he, he lost his, a, lo a lot of friends. It's not a, he's a very, was is to a very uh, respectable man in his community and uh, he found it very hard sir it's a, it's a hard fall people as i'm sure you know they they do tend to believe um what what is being said about people it's a natural normal consequence of being uh, accused of a serious crime sir yes i follow um what do what can you remember what article it is in the, the remedies law that uh, in, gives an entitlement to exemplary damage? Uh, no, sir. But I have the remedy here. The Article 10, sir, gives the measure of damages. Uh, I'm, 
going to say, sir, at a um, quick glance that there's no specific provision for exemplary damages, sir. But in my respectful submission, that wouldn't, uh, that would not mean that, that it wasn't available. It's a common law remedy, sir. Well, there is a common law remedy it's generally known as punitive damages, I think. Maybe it's... Uh, in, in New Zealand, we're calling it exemplary. Same thing, sir. Damages to punish. Yes, yes damages to punish. Not to profit from the wrong, often it is. That's correct, sir. Well, yes. Mr. Cannon, do you have any other submissions you'd like to make in opposition to this application to uh, plead Mr. these Honours, causes of, of action? Uh, if, uh, if I may comment, Your Honour, on the... First, the, this was not... The, uh, this, this was not part of the application. It was only part of the, uh, uh, of the skeleton argument. So it should have been part of the application in the first place before he put it on the, uh, on the skeleton argument. But on it the was in the application. Sorry, I must interrupt you. I don't wish to appear rude. But it is in the application. We've seen it. The application that was issued in November sought leave to plead no, but... a case in malicious but... prosecution and abuse of process. I'm, I'm referring to the, to the draft uh, of the counterclaim, Your Honour. Well, if I might be heard on that, sir, uh, in the witness statement dated the 11th of November, it, it was pleaded out on pretty much the same basis yes. uh, as, as I've done now. Yes. Uh, but the, but the, the question remains regarding the, the reason that led the company to revert to the uh, public prosecutor in Dubai and take the, the, the criminal proceedings action. In fact, this was not due to the question of personal payments as much as it was due to the, to the uh, applicant refusal to return a very essential and important uh, instrument, uh, important uh, instruments in the company, which are, which is the computer, which is the ownership of the company. The uh, the applicant, in, instead, in, in spite of many reminders, he failed to return two computers and not one. The earlier c c computer, his uh, his uh, earlier computer and the, the current computer which was, he was using. These two c c computers contain a very uh, important and essential data which may lead to a lot of problems in the, uh, in the company in the future if the data was deleted or if the data was manipulated or if the data is not available. He managed to even when the, the computers were returned, it was found that he managed to delete part of this data, which touches the core of the, uh, of the company business. This is from one side. So in spite of the repeated reminders for him to return to, this, uh, to return these two computers, Abdul Azim refused to, to do so. The only way to compel him to, to return these computers is by filing a complaint with the police. This was the only way. And the only time that he has, he has uh, accepted to return is that when he was called by the police and sur surrendered the, 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 the two c computers. This is the core of the issue. Then the findings of the expert, Your Honor, did not relate to whether this is, the, this is uh, authorized or not authorized, the, the personal payment. It was... Uh, uh, the, the expert findings that the, uh, the, the, uh, the payments which has been made by Abdul Azim tally the, 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 the payments which is uh, re requested by the, by, the, by the suppliers. 
So this is an accountancy process which has nothing to do with the findings itself. The, 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 based on this, the public prosecutor re, re, reserved the, the file. It was reserved because the figures tally and not because he is authorized or not authorized to, to do his, uh, the, the personal payments and then re recover these payments. And as I mentioned earlier, this was only discovered during the, the audit uh, of, of Deloitte and thereafter by, by uh, Ernest and Young. And at that time, Ernest and Young findings which had led to, to, to propose another system of accountancy. When this system of accountancy was produced, at, at this point of time, the, he, had, he had submitted his, his res, uh, resignation because this system, this new system, would not allow him to mani manipulate in the, in the company accounts. This is, therefore, the, the, the complaint filed with the police was not actually directed uh, in, in relation to the accounts it was directed towards requesting the return of the computers, which, and then this, the, the, uh, he, for four months, he was able to delete a very important data and to manipulate with the, with the figures on the, on the, on the, on the computer. And he was an expert in this. He was an expert in the, uh, in this tech, tech, technicality. This was, the, the purpose of the uh, of filing the complaint, Your Honour. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm subject to one or two conditions. I'm going to give permission for these causes of action to be introduced by amendment. Now. The conditions are that the plea of general damages and exemplary damages must be fully particularized. When I asked Mr. Bowden how he came to the sum of about a million dollars under general damages, he began to give a series of particulars orally. Uh, and I'm going to require full particularization of the general damages claim, each and every matter which is relied on to come to a figure of a uh, um, uh, uh, million dollars. I don't require you to maintain a claim for a million dollars but um, uh, I'm not prohibiting you from doing so, but you must plead out full particularity, all the matters that justify a, uh, this general high, very high claim for general damages, and you must plead out to the exemplary damages claim. You must plead out what the, the juristic foundation of the claim is but at the moment um, it seems that there is no entitlement under the, the damages law but I think, I just don't know whether there is a, a specific entitlement to exemplary damages under the damages law or not but it will be for Mr Bowden to make uh, uh, um, full researches into the, the damages law to see if there is an entitlement under that law, and if the entitlement is to be at common law, then that entitlement must be pleaded out. The common law authorities will set out the circumstances which must prevail before there is a good claim for uh, exemplary damages, and the pleading must plead those aspects of this case which give an entitlement to exemplary damages having regard to what's been said in the authorities as to an entitlement to exemplary or punitive damages.
Now, how long do you need to um, produce an amendment that meets those conditions, Mr. Bowden? Uh, if, I, if I might, sir, just if I can just take, I don't mean to ask, answer a question with a question, but there was some, some particular, and I should have pointed this out to you before, sir, but say if we go to page 162 of, of the attachment, sorry, the attachment to the skeleton, the schedule to the skeleton. Page 162. 162 to paragraph 15. I don't know what you're, I'm so sorry, I don't know what you're referring to. Ah, sorry, that's my, under tab 16, sir, my skeleton. Um, well, I don't have anything in tab 16. I've got your most recent, I've got your most recent skeleton uh, uh, argument. Bottom right hand corner, page 162. Sorry, that, that is the draft pleading, sir. That's the draft pleading. Well, I've got the draft pleading, yes. Yes. And at paragraph 15 of the draft pleading. Paragraph 15, yes, here I am. Yep. Exactly. The reason why I was able to remember those uh, matters, sir, is because I've recently written them down. Um, so so I, I would particularise out those matters. Well, um, that's pleaded out for the malicious prosecution. Yes, sir. Uh, abuse of process, we don't have an equivalent plea. And I'm not going to depart from the condition that I've imposed on you. You have to give full particularity in respect of each cause of action of the general damages and the exemplary damages which are being sought. Do you understand? Exactly, sir. Now, how yes, long do. do you want? How long do you um, want so to, to prepare a... Um, uh, I can do that in a fortnight, sir. 14 days? Yes, sir. Right. Well, then the I can see... Sorry, the, the question I wanted to ask was, should I be ascribing, um, say, we were detained at the police station, should I be describe, ascribing, sorry, a numerical figure to that? Put a number on no. each... No, no. You did, uh, I don't think so. I think you have to... Um, it's very difficult in general damages claims to do so, where it's not a specific figure. You have to um, identify all those factual matters which justify a general damages claim. And in paragraph yes. 15, you're... You're uh, um, um, along the, the right lines in paragraph 15, but that's not sufficient. You're going to, you can repeat what's said in paragraph 15 if you wish, but you, you, what you've got to do is to plead it all out now, and it'll be no good at trial wanting to toss something else the, the, um, in for this or for that. You owe it to the uh, defendant to the counterclaim, the claimant in the action, to set out in full everything you rely on by, for your general damages and your um, punitive exemplary damages. Understood? Absolutely. So I give you leave, I give you leave on condition that you <coughs> incorporate into your pleading, these full particulars that I've already set out uh, as required. Thank you. All right? Right. Now, security for costs. Uh, if, you, if, uh, if I may, Your Honor, uh, we need time also to, to re respond to whatever... Of course, me, and you Mr. will Bowden. have... Of course you, have, you, you must have time, and what's more, you're entitled to your costs in the pleading. Yes. Just as I awarded uh, earlier on when I <coughs> uh, um, said that, that there would be costs consequent on, the, uh, on an amendment to the pleading, the same applies here. Leave to amend 
at this stage and for this sort of cause of action carries with it an, um, an obligation to pay the costs of and incidental to the, um, the amendment. So the cost that you incur in pleading to this amendment will be your costs, which will be at the, at the end of the day will be an item in, for your credit. And how long would you like, uh, Mr. Cannon, to respond in your in pleading? In light of the uh, prevailing s s situation, possibly I would need one, one month, Your Honor. 28 days. Sorry? I'll give you 28 days. Perfect. Fair enough, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And so can we now move to security for costs? Now, Mr. Bowden, you've set out in your skeleton argument the, the basis for your claim that you, sh you, you should have security for the cost of the claim that's brought by the claimant company. Yes, Um, well, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, no, sir. No? Mr. Cannon, your response yes, to this on, claim for security for cost? Uh, we are of the opinion that this should be dealt also with at the trial, uh, here at the trial, and not at this time. Uh, because this is in line with the reg regulations, uh, which is in, in, in particular uh, Rule 25107 of the RDC uh, states, first applications for security for costs should not be made later, later than the the, uh, so later than at the case management c conference. And in any event, any application should not be left until close to, to the trial date. Delay to the, uh, uh, to, to the prejudice of the other party or the administration of justice will probably cause the application to fail as will, will any use of the application to, har to harass the other party, where it is intended to make an application for security at the case management conference, the procedure and timetable for evidence for an ordinary application must be followed. This is the, the law cit citation, Your Honor. Yes. So the, yeah. So the, the, the application did not satisfy these requirements. The applicant had adequate opportunity to apply for security for cost on 26 August 2019, but has failed to do so. Therefore, I mean, and further, the, the application is seeking security for, for its own expenses for filing these applications, which have caused the respondent to expend unnecessarily considerable resources, time and effort, when the original trial was scheduled to proceed as per August 26 CMC during the same month of these hearings in February 2020. Yes. Um, the, 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 the defendant is a DIFC company, that's right, isn't it? Yes, it is. And um, does it, is it under legal obligation to file audited accounts annually? Yes, of course, Your Honor. And um, are you able to tell me the latest set of audited accounts that have been published? I need to check it, Your Honor, but... Yeah. 
I, I, I don't have the, the, the dates in my mind now, Your Honor. Is there anyone in court with you who could um, um, let you know um, what the, the date of the last set of audited accounts is that have uh, been produced pursuant to the law? It was November, Your Honor, November 2019. November, yes. No November 2019. 2019. Yes. 19. Well, Mr. Bowden's made no reference to those um, uh, accounts. Um, Mr. Bowden, I'm not satisfied that a proper foundation for an order for security for costs has been laid. You refer to um, judgments which were obtained by previous sets of lawyers for the defendant um, company and you refer to the fact that a payment was, that had been ordered to be made w was made just before a particular event. And you ask the court to conclude that unless security is ordered, there's a real doubt that the claimant company would have sufficient resources to pay your costs if you, were, if you succeeded in the action. Um, you don't make any reference to the audited accounts, which I uh, assume uh, would be publishable under the DIFC um, uh, corporate governance. And um, if, uh, if the accounts showed financial frailty, I would have assumed that they would have been referred to, but they haven't been. Well, um, yes, sir, I, I don't wish to be heard any further. Um, we've, we've, all, all that we can say in respect of that matter, sir, is that uh, the assets of the company largely reside in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, but it is a DIFC company that owns those assets, sir. So, yes, I, I don't wish to be heard, but thank you. Well, um, I'm not satisfied on the material before me that an order for security uh, should be made if there is any fundamental change of circumstance that wasn't available, that goes to matters that were not available as of today's date, well then, of course, you'd have liberty to make a fresh application if anything emerged. I think so. the circumstances have gone against us because the two, two of the claims have been struck out, the 1.3 and the 1.4. So yes. So if any if anything, our claim has gotten worse. Well, for the security for cost claim has gotten worse on account of our success in the first two applications. Yes, yes, that's also a fair point you make. So I'm, the, the uh, application for security for cost is refused, but as is usual, but uh, um, I say usual, uh, there is always liberty to apply, but only where there has emerged a fundamental change of circumstances relating to matters that wouldn't have been available to you to bring before the court in support of this application. Now, I think the last matter on the agenda is this. I have refused to strike out the Maraba claim. That is a claim that will go to trial. I've indicated that I do not, at the moment, on the material before me, uh, I regard it as um, a somewhat weak claim. I see difficulties in respect of it. And for that reason, 
Um, I do not think it can stand as a set-off to, to the extent that judgment ought not to be given for the claims which I have said are good claims. Instead, I'm taking the middle course that where I have held upheld claims, money claims, those sums of money must be paid into court by the defendant. And I would suggest that they should be paid into court within 21 days. If the sums are not paid into court within 21 days, then there will be judgment for the claims. Um, of course, the Maraba claim will continue to be a claim that can be made in the proceedings. But there will be judgment for the claims unless the sums of money are paid into court. I was, I'm uh, at the moment minded for 21 days. Mr. Karab, do you have any submissions to make as the amount of time you should be allowed to bring these claims into court? Uh, we believe, uh, Your Honor, that due to the, because the, uh, the, the business, main business of the company is not in Dubai yet, it's outside Dubai, the, the, it's, the IFC business is separate from the outside Dubai, but in order to get the transaction dealt with and accordingly, well, I think we, believe, we need more than one month, Your Honor. Well, to, the absolute maximum I would give you, the maximum I'd give you is 28 days. I'll give you 28 days, but no more. 28 okay, days to bring these sums into court. Sure. Now, there must be sure. another CMC. In the light of the decisions that have been made in the course of this proceeding, there, there must be another CMC. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Can I just raise one other preliminary? Yes. Preliminary. Speak up, please. Yes, sorry. There, there were, uh, just in my skeleton, sir, at paragraph 78, there were two more applications which I think are spent yes. and it should go, uh, and then, then yes. we were going to come back to the matter of interest, sir. Which we go, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to, the, we'll come back to that. I'm just trying to wrap things up, albeit somewhat piecemeal fashion. I've given 28 days for the money to come into court. Uh, and I've refused the application for security for costs. Now, there's the outstanding matter of interest. Now, I will, what I have in mind, but I want you both to respond, is that short written submissions are provided to the court on the question of interest, with full reference to the relevant law and any relevant decided cases and I will decide the question of interest on the papers. Now, you're seeking the interest, Mr. Bowden, so I'd like your submissions within seven days. No problem, sir. Thank you. And, Mr. Cannon, I'd like your reply within ten days on the sure. question of interest. I agree, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So but I will the, then the, deal with... The, the, the 10 uh, days follows, his, follows Mr. Bowden. That's uh, right. Response. He follows his service of his, of his submissions. So first off, seven days for the, for the counterclaiming defendant, and then you have a further 10 days to reply. And I will then issue a short ruling. In the meantime, there should be an order for at least the principal sum to be paid into court. And uh, we'll, we'll wait and see what the outcome on the interest claim is as to any further orders which are necessary. Now, Mr. Um, Bowden, I'm going now to ask you to deal with the other outstanding matters which are, are, are for decision today. Can you take them one by yes. one? Yes, sir. Um, so that, that is at uh, page 154 of the skeleton, sir. Yes. And paragraph 78. Yes, um, 154. 
Yes, and so it's set out there, um, set out four matters, but in reality it's three. And there was a CFI 029-2008-5. That application has been withdrawn and costs have been awarded and paid. So that doesn't need to be considered. So, so that's gone? Yes, that's gone, yes. sir. Um, the, the application um, number six uh, simply sought to enlarge the hearing timetable from the last CMC. That's, that's obviously now redundant. Um, yes. And application number seven also sought to uh, vacate the hearing for the earlier one that's being withdrawn and cost ordered anyway. So application number seven sought to vacate the hearing which had been set for application number five. So six and seven don't, don't mean anything anymore, sir. No, I agree. Uh, and so they should be dismissed. Um, well, I'll hear from Mr Cannon, but at the moment I see what you say. Shall we just ask Mr. Cannon to respond to those two points? Uh, I need to, 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 to consult the, the client, Your Honor, on this matter. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a matter for the lawyers, isn't it? I mean, it, 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 given the events that have occurred, it must mean that those two matters are now defunct and have gone, it's okay, it seems to me. We agree, Your Honour. All right, thank you very much. Yes, next, thank Mr Bowden. Um, no, that's, that's it, sir, for me. That's it. Right. Now, Mr Bowden, I want you to be the prime mover in drawing up an order to capture yes, everything that's been decided today. Um, and, of course, you'll then send it over uh, to your learned friend so I get an agreed order. If there's any dispute, I'll decide it. But I hope there won't be. Uh, I think it's very plain what has been decided, what's been allowed and what has not been allowed. As to the costs of today, you've won some and... Um, you haven't won some, Mr. Bowden. Um, I would be minded to say that the costs ought to be costs in the counterclaim. So if you succeed in your counterclaim, you can have the costs of today. But if you don't, then there'll be no order as to cost. With respect, sir, given that there's been orders of indemnity costs uh, in relation to claims one, and I, I believe application number two as well, I'm subject to correction, um, shouldn't we have, have those? Sir? There's no real reason why those No, you haven't had follow. indemnity costs on claim two, have you? Just on one then, sir. Sorry. Subject yeah, well, yeah, that stands. I mean, that's... You, 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 uh, th that's separate from the other costs of today. You've I been see. awarded that portion of ah. your costs of today in having set aside the, that, the, the judgment is awarded to you and on an indemnity basis. But the costs of all other matters of today should be costs, I think, in the counterclaim. I have nothing to say about that. Thank you, sir. Right. I, I don't Mr. Cannon, you, 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 you follow that I'm, the, course, the cost will depend course, on who succeeds on the counterclaim. Of course. Okay? Right, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, now, Mr. Bowden, I'd like an order drawn up fairly fast. Yes, sir. Can you get something out? I mean, today it's Monday. Can you get something out by close of business on Wednesday? To, yes, um, to, we have a draft order, but this. obviously it needs changing. So. No, it needs it needs adjusting. Yes, sir. Well, can you do it by close of business tomorrow to get a, a, a draft out to Mr. Uh, Cannon? Yes, my um, associate says that she can, sir. Right. Well, then, please, um, a draft order drawn up by the um, defendant counterclaimant to be submitted for perusal by um, 
the uh, solicitors for the, the claimant by close of business tomorrow. And then I would uh, like the, um, Mr. Cannon to respond um, within 48 hours as to your draft. And if yeah, there's any... Uh, Your Honor, yes? Sorry, Your Honor, but uh, we ha if, if we look at the, at, at the timing, uh, we are ending up with, with a weekend of two days, uh, Friday and Saturday. Oh, it's which working usually... days. No, it's working it's, days. Not... Yeah, work, okay. working. It's working days. Okay. Okay. Working days. Okay, Your Honor. It's working days. Please. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I expect the usual sensible level of cooperation between the parties in the, in the, the of settling course, of this order. And if there's any difficulty, then track change... Track changes showing the differences will be sent to me and I will decide um, what the order should say. But I, I hope very much that um, that won't be unnecessary. Uh, well, I, I think that, then that, con that concludes matters for today. I'm very grateful to Council from both sides um, for the contribution that they've made. We've got through um, quite a lot in the, in, the, uh, in the time. We've been uh, nearly three and a half hours and um, I think we can all give ourselves a bit of a pat on the back for having achieved in three and a half hours quite a lot. But my sure thanks to are. both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, Thank you I'm, going to rise, I'm going to rise now and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the matter is concluded. Thank you very much. Thank you.